Okay, I've been, I've been given the signal to, to start talking, so I'll start talking over you if I need to. Um, second presentation, I'm going to start talking about um, two projects, one which I'm currently working on, um, which is, is funded, and another one which I've applied to the Australian Research Council for. And I'm confident, um, <laughs> quietly confident that it, it might, that it'll be, there'll be a funded project in there somewhere. So as, as suggested here, I'm talking about the, the training of triple helix researchers. Less, I'll actually be spending less time on that, more on university industry collaboration in resource-based economies, looking at Australia, Norway, and um, Canada. And I'll also make some brief references to, to Russia as well, because in my interactions with, with Olga <laughs> the other day, we decided to add in some, some Russian data, because Russia is also a, a resource-based economy, one which, as an outsider, I wasn't uh, confident to, to mention I would be examining when applying to the Research Council. I think uh, you have to, I think three countries is, is sort of the magic number for being feasible while also being interesting. If I put Russia in initially, the people might have got a bit scared. So, but it, it is certainly out there in the open for potentially looking into it later. So firstly, what is, oh, why is university industry collaboration important? In many countries, we've seen research funding, which has been earmarked for or classified as basic or theoretical research. As a proportion of total research funding, we've seen that decline and, and a greater emphasis on research that's applied, practical oriented, or, um, or focused towards um, development rather than purely theoretical. And this kind of, this is, impacting upon the types of research that academics are being funded to do and the types of research that they're doing. I mentioned before the norms of science, disinterested nature of research has been coming under some, some strain, perhaps for, or perhaps it's not coming under strain in that academics are finding ways to pursue practically oriented research while maintaining the disinterestedness and the theoretical contributions, but that's a, that's a debate to be had. The triple helix model for innovation it's something which stemmed out of the, the late 1990s and it talks about the, the role in which the state, academia and industry either collaborate or, or um, coexist in an innovation system and the argument is that we're moving, we've moved away from a system where the state either coordinates a state, uh, I guess the, uh, Russia has a, a strong tr tradition of that where the state directs what research is going on in, the ac in academia and we're moving away from a more um, laissez-faire or, or um, leaving it to each of those academia, industry and state to decide how they, how they collaborate or how they develop their networks towards one where these three elements are coming together and it's not just changing the types of research that academics are pursuing but it's also changing the universities themselves they're becoming more perhaps um, entrepreneurial or more focused on doing the research and development and the commercialization activities themselves there's also related um, theses about movement <coughs> away from mode one research which is pure, theoretical, developed within a disciplinary context towards mode two research with a practical orientation in mind from the beginning with uh, interdisciplinary and, and cross-sectoral um, evaluation of the, the quality of the research rather than it being evaluated purely within disciplinary frameworks. The argument has been made that um, universities are no longer um, interested, primarily interested in theoretical research, they're now primarily interested in, in applied <coughs> research, or at least that's the argument of Gibbons and Novotny. And um, related to this are the, the, the idea of a third mission for universities needing to not just be engaged in training 
uh, teaching students and training the professions and training R&D personnel and PhDs, not, or on the teaching side and doing research, um, pure theoretical research on the research side. There's also this contribution to society that universities need to make because they're receiving public funding and increasingly they're receiving private funding from students and from industry. They need to, to give, something, give something back or contribute to the national economy. Uh, the post-World War II model of innovation saw in, in the United States saw the idea that um, if we pump money into theoretical research, this linear model would mean that the universities do the disinterested basic research, companies and others will somewhere in the future find a way to apply this research and commercialise it and it will generate um, benefits to society. This hands-off ap approach for those two sectors of industry and universities is, is com is, has been sort of um, debated and now we, we expect that government is somehow involved in steering the, the research done in universities. Uh, from a paper from 2015 of mine and some colleagues, again looking at surveys of academics and research intensive universities, one question asked them, I know it's, it's difficult to read, but um, to what extent do they consider their research to be purely theoretical or, oh, to theoretical or basic? To what extent do they consider their research to be practically oriented and applied? The, m the main point here, the, the, the top country in terms of academics saying that their research is theoretical and not applied or applied but not theoretical, it doesn't even reach 50% because the, the other, the majority of academics would report that their research has, contains both theoretical elements as well as applied elements of their primary research. Perhaps this is both an indication that mode two research is uh, now a, a big part of the majority of academic behaviours in that they're not pursuing pure, purely theoretical research. But on the other hand, um, the argument from mode two that a disinterested theoretical research is no longer a preoccupation within universities doesn't provide support for that either because clearly if people are involved in both types of research or consider both of them relevant to their research, then disinterested purely theoretical research still holds an important place in most um, academic research. Um, there, there are differences across, across countries, but I won't, I won't go into to detail there. So part of the presentation is about the training of, um, of researchers, PhDs. So it's important to, uh, that, that will be at the end of the presentation, but there is a, to, to outline some of the importance for PhD researchers, what, why industry collaboration is, uh, is something that's of relevance and importance. There's, I would say, a relative oversupply of PhDs compared to what we can predict as being the demand for PhD qualified staff in universities. It's quite, um, student numbers are quite predictable, even in a country like Australia where there's a lot of international students and that fluctuates. We know how many students are graduating from high school each year. We can roughly predict um, how many students will be entering university and, and prepared. And the, the growth rates for required for teaching and research in universities uh, for, from these high school cohorts and from international students just doesn't match the, the, the great oversupply of PhDs that we're awarding. That's not to say that um, all PhDs should find their way to academic work, but each year there's an oversupply and each year there's an accumulation of this, um, this group of PhDs who aren't able to secure academic work, even though they, that, that is their motivation. Some universities would argue that uh, PhDs have interest in industry careers. Um, my university believes that. Um, I say to them, well, we've surveyed PhDs and they overwhelmingly say that they want academic careers. Uh, but um, the universities themselves still think that because PhDs can't find academic work and find their way into industry, therefore we should train PhDs for industry careers. I would say we should recruit fewer PhDs in and train them better for academic careers that match their interests, but um, 
maybe there is maybe there are people who decide that they want a PhD so that they can pursue an R and D um, career in industry, but we don't have those much R and D uh, going on in Australia compared to other countries. PhDs may benefit from industry funding. Uh, PhD scholarships rather low relative to any sort of job that you could get in Australia, and uh, you can supplement it and um, therefore doing research of interest to industry, or industry broadly defined, including government, um, could be of benefit. It's also important to remember that during the PhD, this is where, this is the formative years for, for future R&D personnel. So if we can find ways to better integrate industry relevant topics and industry supervisors, then this may shape the types of uh, PhD graduates that we have in Australia, I showed you the post, the, the costs or the salaries for postdocs, they're very high. Um, the costs for PhDs, so postdoc was something like uh, 67,000 US dollars a year of salaried, and then you've got all the benefits on top of that. We would pay a standard scholarship for a PhD in Australia might be about uh, 17,000 US dollars tax-free but without any particular benefits. So there's a huge, the labour, the amount of R&D personnel in universities that are PhDs is, is very, they're a very large share. So it's important to utilise these resources for the benefit of the university and um, the academics themselves. Finally, there are huge government incentives for university industry collaboration. Australian government has quite a lot of money, doesn't really know what to do do with it. It knows that it wants the economy to grow and it thinks that um, it, the universities are not well engaged with industry and if they just provide money to incentivise this, have, let's, for example they're introducing something what will cost something around about say 20,000 Australian dollars or 15,000 US per internship, so funding a whole lot of internship places, what the government will do is say here's a bunch of money for internships give it to the universities and say, can you please make sure that your <laughs> PhDs have more internships? What the universities will do is they'll absorb these, a lot of this funding as administrative costs <laughs> in trying to, to find PhDs, uh, internships and the matching processes. It's, it's very, very expensive and, qu and quite wasteful, but not just on the PhD point of view, but also uh, in terms of the block grants, the, the lump sum payments that the governments make to the Australian universities, they're shifting the metrics away from um, academic scholarly research towards um, funding, uh, towards uh, industry engagement broadly defined. So uh, there might be a multiplier effect that comes from you get a million dollars of funding from the Research Council, the government will then increase the block grant to universities by $500,000, so there's a multiplier effect there. Now they're starting to do similar things for the, the metrics to, if you get funding from industry sources, the government will throw in some extra money into your block grant. So there's lots of incentives now coming from the Australian government um, to, to incentivise these things. Uh, this is uh, very briefly doctorate holders by academic activity, oh sorry, by acti economic activity. Australia, I know it's, the point is Australia's here, Norway's here. We're both resource based economies. Australia, lots of our PhDs end up working in universities, 40%. There are, and then there's a, a bunch which work in publicly funded hospitals or public administration, getting up to around 70%. We look at Norway where there's a far greater number of PhDs ending up working in, in, in industry post-PhD. So this is um, something which the government is keen to increase. Um, the, the general, this is just to point out the general oversupply. This is the growth rate in PhDs and high doctorates, the growth rate in academic, all academic positions, and the growth rate in academic positions at the bottom academic ranks. Um, so th we're not going to absorb all these PhDs. One interesting thing to note is that this growth rate is um, entirely, I would say, international PhDs. The growth in domestic PhDs, has, there's, there's not been any. Australians are not pursuing PhDs at a great rate. 
because the scholarships are, are not very good and the scholarships are also, yeah, many don't get scholarships. So a lot of the PhD growth rate has been internationals. So, and some of these won't be competing for <laughs> domestic jobs, maybe because they, they'll be going back to their, their home country. But that said, there's a lot of international competition coming from other English speaking countries for academic jobs. But the point is, PhDs need to find a way to go somewhere else. This is another chart, I'll skip over it. It's just saying that the ratio of what I expect are the ratio of PhDs to vacant positions is increasing over time and the accumulata uh, an accumulation of oversupply, which would take many years to absorb um, all of those PhDs into universities. So university industry engagement can mean different things. So I'll, I'll talk about one uh, conceptualization of university industry engagement. This comes from Marcus Perkman and colleagues is in research policy. It's a type of overview of um, what he describes as academic exchange activities and academic commercialization activities. He differentiates between types of activities based on the, the, broad, the purposes of these activities. Examples of academic exchange might be co-authored publications or co-funded publications with industry in traditional academic scholarly journals could be contract research done, for example, by a university for government or research that's contracted from a not-for-profit to, to the universities or perhaps from business might contract research to universities. You know, academics themselves are much more engaged these days with consulting. It's a bit of a tricky one in that um, it's good for the university that academics engage in consulting, but some academics are finding ways to do the consulting on the side so that the universities don't uh, get the benefits, get the revenue that comes from the consulting. So if someone wants to pay me to do an evaluation of the Russian higher education system and they pay me as a, get a contract with the University of Melbourne, the University of Melbourne might take 50% of of that revenue will go to support the university, 50% will go to my department and I might then within the department not get any more salary than what I currently am at. So my incentives are to say, well, why don't you, rather than hiring me as the University of Melbourne academic, hire Peter Bentley consultancy company and pay them. You win, you pay me less and I win because I get, I keep it all for myself and then I go to go to work each day and I do my consultancy from my desk as, as normal. So it's a bit of a, a bit of a problematic one but it is certainly a form of academic exchange but whether the benefits come to the universities um, directly or not um, is somewhat debatable. Then there are all sorts of informal uh, ways in which um, academics engage with industry supervision, advice and perhaps holding multiple affiliations and that complicates the when someone has an affiliation to a university and to an industry partner, but it's actually just a tokenistic <laughs> um, affiliation to, to make it look like there's greater engagement um, between a university and industry, that, 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 that uh, is problematic for the validity of, of some of these, these measures. Commercialization, I'll spend a little, oh, I should say that the purposes for academic exchange are that they both serve the academic traditional goals for academic careers as well as some, some utilitarian purpose for the person funding or collaborating on the industry side. So it, it serves dual goals, they tend to be much broader. Commercialization activities are focused much more narrowly on, protect, on exploiting the, the commercial benefits of knowledge and protecting that knowledge from um, being used by others so that these benefits can be monopolized by the person producing the knowledge or using it. And examples include spin-off companies and um, patents and licensing, although patents themselves, if they start to be, if universities start to be evaluated or academics start to be evaluated by the number of patents that they're producing, um, then we would expect to see that patents are being generated that don't actually have commercial uh, benefits in mind, they're just being used as an academic um, activity to, to increase one's uh, potential within academic careers. 
licensing is, is another one. These are, if we look at the Australian data for licensing revenues, you find it's uh, heavily skewed. There would be a handful of licenses that generate a huge amount of benefits and a whole lot of licenses that, that don't generate much. And we're not really at a good stage of f within the university of knowing uh, which ones are likely to be those, um, I don't know what they call it, unicorns or something, maybe they call it in Silicon Valley. But um, anyway, they do exist and they're a type of commercialization, whether it should happen, whether it should be coordinated within university or, or, or not, or on the fringe of the university, I'm not so sure. So some academic motivations. There's a fair bit of literature on asking why do academics engage with industry? Far less literature on why, do, why does industry or individuals within industry collaborate with academics on research projects. The belief is that industry engagement is a discretionary activity. So academics are not rewarded directly for it. Teaching and research are the things which academics do. Industry engagement is something which they may or may not do. It's not clearly part of the core academic activities. It's not measured in the same way. And therefore, we need to create some incentives to, to encourage it. Academics may be motivated to, um, to engage with industry so that they can commercialise their ideas. But a lot of studies find that ac the academics are still motivated by some of those uh, traditional uh, norms of science, whereby they're, they're actually looking to learn from industry for the benefit of scientific research rather than being motivated by the commercial outcomes. Sometimes it's about developing reputation. Um, it can be good to, to have for recruiting your PhDs, to have industry contacts and social benefits that come from, from these uh, engagement with industry partners. There are obviously some some benefits that come from accessing industry funding for their financial resources to hire PhDs and postdocs and access to in-kind or labs and data as well. The policy implications are of course that we need to incentivize it. Life cycle, uh, what I mean here is there's research showing that academics in the early stages of their careers, this sort of two-stage career model again, Reward people need to prove themselves within their discipline before they can start to do things which are outside the which are not likely to be published in scholarly journals. So, industry engagement is something which senior academics do or junior academics do after they've progressed in their career. And institutional elements are that the research intensive sectors traditionally have not engaged as much with industry as those uh, less research intensive universities, often because of the, the histories that, you know, these, these are former polytechnics which get relabeled as universities and they still carry all of those traditional ties. Perkman, um, and again, it's not, it sh I know that it, it would be difficult for you to, to see, I just put this up as, uh, as an example somewhat of an analytical framework because some of my discussion with some of you about your research projects, you, you've got a research question, you've got a dependent variable of sorts and you're trying to understand well, what are the factors associated with economic growth in my region or students coming to my university. And you need to be, uh, there, there will be factors and there will be many other studies of these things <coughs> and if you can find a a review study that's in a good journal which s classifies all of those factors within a smaller number of broad groups and subgroups. It allows you to approach the research topic already in mind and collecting the data in line with the theoretical framework that's already been established. So in my case, this is academic engagement. He believes that it, it, in, it involves a, a combination of institutional factors, which are the macro factors, and institutional being the, the, insti the, the broad institutional framework, not the actual organisations themselves. So public policy, regulations, it can be the, the way in which academic disciplines communicate. 
So those, there are these macro factors, organisational factors like the support and policies within the university, the type of university you're at, and individual level factors like your motivations, your career stage and, and so forth. And it, these things interact and, and somehow predict or, or provide the, um, the situation where university industry engagement can flourish. And then there's the out, outputs or the outcomes of this engagement. The, the most important one being that the belief that university uh, academics who engage with industry are like from government's point of view are likely to are more likely to generate some kind of commercial output which will either benefit the university or benefit society economic growth and so forth the link between academic engagement with industry and commercial benefits i think is 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 tenuous um, but it is what underpins when and particularly the australian government sees metrics of academic exchange or academic engagement, which show us as the bottom of the OECD. Government says, therefore, we need to increase. This is a problem. We need to increase academic engagement with industry because we believe that this is hampering our innovative innovation performance. Uh, firm level motivations. This definitely won't, you won't read, but don't worry, I won't spend long on this slide. Um, the point is that the firms, uh, whereas academics engage with firms or with industry for individual level reasons, firms engage with universities based on the firm, the, the organisational uh, motivations. So the, the, the autonomy of academics means that we need to understand who they are and their individual motivations, whereas organisations and firms, they have their own, uh, they're, they're, they're managing their R&D staff and uh, R&D staff in industry are, are less likely to pursue something which is not of interest to, to their employer. And uh, Bozeman and colleagues, when looking at how uh, technology transfer uh, occurs and the factors associated with it, point out that firms, um, government and universities have different definitions for what is effective technology transfer and collaboration. Yes, John. Um, Peter, could you help clarify for me which of these are pie in the sky kind of things that the government wants but may not get versus say how the Australian system differs um, in areas where in other countries like the US or Canada there is a proven clear cut link according to discipline. So for example in computer software, in biology, with or without government initiative, firms have long sought um, things. So for example, economics journals have no real value in the private market, but chemistry and biology journals used to be the case that firms would pay up to $40,000 for a subscription because getting that journal publication instantly gave them huge advantages. So there was literally a market value on a publication. So in some sense, the industry university collaborations there were organic, mm -hmm. whereas in other cases, they're more tenuous, or the industry was doing it out of goodwill or something like that. So I, I'm surprised you don't talk both. And it seems to me there are two different dimensions of that. One is across industries, but then across countries. So that if there's already no natural demand, say, in software in Australia for Australian okay. software, guys, then, you know, what would that mean? Um, well, I, I, I think what you're getting, one, one of your critiques here is aggregating university industry collaboration and technology transfer across all industries and coming up with a single metric and, and not understanding how it differs between different disciplines and different industries. And rather than addressing that right now, I'll address that a little bit later because that's the, the fundamental reason why I'm wanting to look at a single industry and understand collaboration within that industry and within that disciplinary context, rather than looking at the, uh, the OECD metrics which aggregate all industries and all universities and look at this at a very aggregate level. Um, but getting back to the point of this slide is just that the definition of effectiveness Firms, industry will be interested in opportunity cost and the market impact, the impact that 
this collaboration or this technology has on reducing costs or increasing the quality of the output. Whereas universities are more likely to define effective collaboration in terms of how it helps develop the, the, human, the, the research um, human capital, the scientific and technological capital within the university, within themselves, their PhDs, for the further pursuit of scientific research. Government has I interests in economic development and the public value that may come from greater collaboration across these sectors. Um, these, of course, are not mutually exclusive. They're just some generalizations that come out from, from this paper by Bozeman. So I'll move on to some examples of university industry collaboration. This is, um, this is the port of Melbourne. It's um, a brand new, fully autonomous port. It's uh, high tech, leading tech in the world. Oh, Kern's got a question. And I. It's a funny question. Is that an actual picture? Yeah, I know. Okay, it's <laughs> it's not an actual one, but it's no, the it, best. No, it, it looked really like fantastic, like sci-fi sci sci-fi sci port, you know. Yes, yes. <laughs> it, but it does. It's the best I could find last <laughs> night. <laughs> no, no, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been down there, and it, it it looks maybe I haven't been up in the up in the sky, but it, it does represent, they, they've done what they said they were going to do, and this is the best I could, I could do on this slide. But thanks, thanks for embarrassing me on that point. <laughs> um, okay, so it's a great example, very expensive investment from the Victorian state government. Stra Melbourne and Australia just keeps growing, particularly in the, these capital cities, and so much freight needs to come in from or from, from sea because we, we don't produce much ourselves. We import almost everything, um, all our cars. We, don't have, a, we don't, don't have very many large local industries and we're very much a trading country. So there's a lack of capacity, need more capacity. Do we in, increase the capacity of existing ports? Do we build new ports the same way that we've got our existing ports? Or do we redevelop the well, there are different uh, approaches that they can take. What the Victorian government did was that well, redeveloping existing ports or building new ones along the same lines would mean dealing with the trade unions who are managing to get quite good wages for dock workers. So they put it out to tender to build a, great, uh, a new port um, near, to, near to the port of Melbourne. <coughs> and the outcome was this, this very high-tech um, autonomous port, um, oh, sorry, uh, automated port. And it's a great example of university industry collaboration because the, the ideas that underpinned the, the, the cranes the, and the autonomous trains came from a long history of, of collaboration between the company and the university. There's a history of staff from moving from the company to the university and um, generating R&D in collaboration that once the, once the autonomous cranes have been built and developed, the production goes to China, but the, the R&D remains within the, the university. It's, um, uh, it's like it's just started operation. I went on a, a tour recently. It's uh, how I might imagine an Amazon factory whereby there's no people and it operates 24-7, highly efficient, no risk for human error or no risk for on, on safety. The, the problem is that you know, this, this great example of university industry collaboration was a collaboration between Kalmar and Tampere University of Technology. It wasn't an Australian example. We've got fantastic universities in Australia and in Melbourne, but we're not developing um, these sorts of cutting edge technology on in this regard. The great benefit, of course, is that when the Victorian government decides that it's going to fund this, it funds the, the, most, the, the best applicant, and if they come from Finland or they come from Germany or the USA or elsewhere, the, the, the residents of Melbourne benefit from having a, a very efficient port. But one question is, well, how can we in Australia develop some of these niche expertise um, in certain areas? 
And this is the, the chart that's often shown um, in government policy papers or referred to. And it's from OECD data, which is generated from national level data. Firms collaborating on innovation with higher education or research institutions. It's by firm size. So the, the dark blue being the, the bigger, large firms and the, small, the, the light blue being small firms. And Finland is on the far left hand side with around 70% of large firms claiming to collaborate with universities and public research centres on their innovation. Australia, uh, it's close to two, maybe two or three percent um, of our, our large firms. In fact, our small firms somehow <laughs> nominate uh, more collaboration than, um, than, than the large ones. And I've just circled the other resource-based economies. This, uh, there are many other countries, but I thought, well, let's keep it, um, keep it somewhat manageable. But you've got Russia and Chile, oh, they're still performing much better than, um, than Australia. But again, our, our reference point being Norway, um, where, there's, where there seems to be a lot more collaboration. Again, we look at, um, sorry that the, 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 the ordering has changed here, but ratings, surveys of businesses asking for rating the knowledge transfer between universities and industry. We find Australia nearer to the, the bottom end um, relative to Switzerland. This is the, the score as a percentage of the top country being Switzerland. Canada seems to do better and, and, and so too Norway. So, yes, yes. Do you make, sorry, do you distinguish the collaboration between universities and private companies and state-owned companies? Because in Russia it's... I do. Uh, but <laughs> these statistics don't, and that's <laughs> what I'm getting. <laughs> that's what I'll be getting at. No, don't worry. I think I'm just setting the scene here. Um, oh, and again, I, I've, I've stuffed up the, the cell ranges here. But Australia, this is a, just a, simply a scatter plot doctoral. We've got a lot of PhDs in the working age population, or a, I guess above the, the sort of average. This is Switzerland out here. With, they've got the most number of PhDs. I think Finland's up here with very strong collaboration and similar number of PhDs working in, in, the, in the labor force. And the other um, resource-based economies are the, the yellow here. Um, but perhaps we, we say we've got decent preconditions for industry engagement. We've got R&D trained staff, but they're just not, it's just not happening. And again, on one, another metric, the percentage of university research publications co-authored with industry. This is uh, as a proportion of the, the leading country, Denmark. Australia, again, gets, the government gets angry at the universities and saying, you need to collaborate more with industry because look at um, some of the leading innovative countries. That's, they, they do it a lot better than, than, than we do. Russia, again, is uh, on the left-hand side of Australia. So. But this is uh, from 2011 to 2013, and I'll show you in a later slide just how much things appear to have changed in some regards in Russia. But of course there are some problems, which is what Victor partly um, mentioned. Problems with these metrics of uh, hammering Australia for being at the bottom of the OECD. The definition of well, who are, what are firms? We've got not just publicly owned utilities and so forth, which Scopus and, and others define as being firms, uh, which are the data underpinning the OECD comparisons. But you also have museums, you have uh, whole, like, even though Australia has, uh, sorry, this one here, it doesn't perform very well on co-publications, the main firm for universities to collaborate with in Australia is a national institute for information communication technologies which is wholly funded by the Australian government and the Australian Research Council. It's a, it's a research lab and it comes up in these statistics as being a firm collaborator. So in Australia's case if we removed that we would find that the perform performance was even worse. But that said, you know, if you look at Canada, one of the main, one of the top collaborators is, um, is uh, public utilities and museums and this is not really what we mean by 
university industry collaboration. Maybe it's, it, there is some, some relevance to it, but it, it's unlikely to be the best metric for saying if we increase collaboration, it's likely to, it's going to increase our innovative performance or in our contribution to, um, to the economy. So we, we also aggregate industries. So our, our government in Australia, and I'm sure it's the same in Norway and elsewhere, says, look, we need to focus our resources on the uh, industries of competitive advantage or comparative advantage for Australia, the ones that generate our, we have, for example, we have a lot of sunshine in Australia. Why don't we have a solar industry that's as good as a cloudy country like Germany? Or we've got large resource sector companies, therefore we should be, you know, the world leaders in, in geology or something else. But, and maybe we are the world leaders in some of them, but they don't come out in, in these metrics because they're aggregating all industries together. So in my project that I'm proposing, I'm looking at purely at the resources sector as a way to disaggregate and see, well, how does Australia compare to other um, resource uh, intensive or resource sector based economies and purely within the disciplines relevant to the resources sector. <laughs> this, this is laughable, but um, you would think that if you're going to b put Australia on a chart with us <coughs> having 2% collaboration, you would have the same reference period to, for how many, for the, the question being, have you collaborated with universities on your innovation over the last three years? you would expect that that same question in Australia would talk about three years. It doesn't. In our, in our statistics, the reference period is, is one year. So it's, it doesn't mean that Australia is performing well on this, but we're, perhaps we're not performing quite as badly as, as our government claims. In terms of the proportion of publications that are co-authored with industry. We, we wouldn't want to see a situation where Australian, <laughs> Australia didn't, uh, declined or decreased its rate of scholarly output just to increase the proportion of our output which is collaborative. But if you're not looking at aggregate output, you're, not, you're missing a really, <laughs> really important metric um, for Australia's performance. Again, the, the problem of validity. If we moved from the bottom to closer to Finland, or from the middle to nearer to Canada on some of these metrics, would it really change, have the perceived impact that government wants? Um, I'm doubtful that, that it would, but um, this, is to be, this is to be discussed and, and it ought to be proved, proven first before we, um, we start getting too worried about it. And fine, oh, well, I should say, the, the tendency in Australia at least is to blame universities for for this performance rather than thinking about, well, what is it about our industry structure or our, this, the incentives for our firms to collaborate with universities? Um, perhaps we should be approaching them and asking them to collaborate more with universities or why are they not, um, rather than saying to the universities. Now, in addition to being highly ranked institutions, because the government also says we need a top 20 ranked university you know, Russia's wanting ones in the top 100. There's probably a thousand universities that have been told that they need to be in the top 100 in the next five years, and they're not going to all get there. Um, <laughs> but the University of Melbourne, currently ranked, I think, 40th in the world, the government says, well, we need one in the top 20. Well, you know, that requires a huge amount of investment in pretty much, if you're going to do it over a short period of time, recruiting professors who have high citations and getting Nobel laureates on your, on your staff, to then say, well, we also want you to, <laughs> to push us up the rankings on, on university industry collaboration is, it, it, it's sending multiple messages and policies, governments change and policies <laughs> change before their, their impact can be really be measured. And, and the final point which leads into the, um, into the, um, the, the project I'm going to describe is that all of this is very descriptive. It doesn't tell us who is collaborating or why they're collaborating or any outcomes from the collaborations. So I've proposed to the Research Council to look at university industry collaboration in the resources sector in, 
in three countries, Australia, Norway, and Canada. I've got some collaborators um, in Canada and Norway. This centre, the Oslo Institute for Research on the Impact of Science, has been established with very long term, typical of the Norwegians with all their money. They say, well, we want to know about research impact, therefore we're going to fund it for, for 10 years or something. And one of my the co-authors on my paper I, cite, I put up earlier is now the director of this, this centre and I'm going to look to that as a way to develop my skills and knowledge about how to measure research impact because frankly I'm not, I'm not there yet and that's a great opportunity for a junior academic to, to, to learn these sorts of things. So um, I've proposed three research questions for my postdoctoral uh, project. Firstly, to, to get over some of these initial problems with the, the charts which aggregate all industries. So can we look at the extent of university industry collaboration across some of these metrics purely within the resource sector rather than aggregating all sectors together? Secondly, this is referring back to the Perkman's framework. What are the factors that are associated with industry collaboration, the academic, why do academics pursue these sorts of activities and with the idea that how can they be better supported by universities through their, um, their, 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 their management and policy. And finally with, with the assistance of the Norwegian colleagues, what's the, what's the impact of these collaborative activities that are being identified? What are they, what's the impact on universities, on the firms and on broader society? From the perspective of the researchers who are in universities and the researchers who are in industry on the same, uh, same projects or the same publications. And this can be identified, these pr uh, projects and publications identified through the bibliometric data. They'll tell who the authors are and the process is to approach, survey and interview those people on both the industry side and on the university side about what their motivations are and how these things can be supported and what their perceived impacts were, whether this collaboration in their view generated any benefit to their firm if they're on the firm side or generated any advancement in um, scientific knowledge on the, on the university side. And I have a, I've merged some of the framework from Perkman and um, Bozeman, but I'll, I'll, skip, I'll skip through that. So with any research that becomes narrowed down, in comparative research there needs to be some um, justification for why you choose that particular sector and why you choose those countries. Now it's quite, um, quite clear in Australia that there's a huge economic impact that comes from our resources sector. It's somewhat less understood the, the contribution of the resources sector, the innovativeness of the production within our resources sector but as um, even though the, the price of commodities that we export has declined in recent years, it hasn't really uh, had a, a, a large impact on, on the Australian economy because our resource sectors are highly efficient and, and quite technologically advanced in how they extract the resources and pretty much extract them and ship them off to China. And as long as China keeps demanding them, if the price goes down and the production is is far more efficient than in other countries like Brazil that um, exports iron ore and, or, um, or Qatar that exports liquefied natural gas, then, um, then the companies will take a hit but it won't be as dramatic as um, the, 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 the employment and the output coming from these sectors will, will continue. The, another important um, thing that's not well understood with the resources sector is the, ro the role of the suppliers. So it's not just big mining companies or, st or stat oil in Norway. There's also a whole lot of people, a lot of small companies that provide certain services, geological services, financial services, um, logistical services to these industries. And these, in some cases, these have been developed um, out of a clear indus active industry policy and in other cases it's been it's organically grown out of um, out of the demand in the economy for these services and uh, other companies coming into in, in Australia this case coming into Australia to provide that 
the importance of comparative research. Well, Norway, Finland and Canada are all wealthy, medium-sized economies. In some ways that makes them price takers on some of the resources that they export. Um, we, all, we have strong regulatory institutions that have all avoided the resources curse that we heard about last night, I believe in part because we have um, strong institutions. Now, there's differences between Australia. I, personally, I think that the Norwegians have a, have a far more long-term approach by having a, you know, a, an investment fund, a national investment fund for the revenue that comes from the resources sector. Okay, now I do need to move quickly. And um, they've had different policies towards um, diversifying themselves away. But we all have, we have high performing university sectors and in particular in, in Norway, it has a high performing sector. I'll quickly move through these. Norway developed under underwater platform drilling. It was out of a state uh, a government intervention to set up Sintef, a resource oh, uh, complemented by this research institute on the campus of NTNU, which is ranked as the top you know, industry collaborator in the world of all universities. Australia has no universities in the top 100 and neither does Canada. And it mandated public ownership and mandated collaboration between the oil sector and the technology enabling sectors. Canada developed synthetic oil or crude from, from sands. It came, the, the technology was developed through public research in the 1920s. Um, it was not commercialised or commercially viable until much later on. When it became commercially viable, the government of Alberta and, uh, was, was keen to ensure that some of the benefits, that the revenue that came from this led to other industries being developed um, in in the local region and some public-private uh, partnerships are still, um, still operating today. It's somewhat more moderate than, than Norway where the oil companies are wholly owned, wholly publicly owned. Australia I would, has been a much more passive industry policy allowing multinational companies to come in and bring their R&D from whichever region of the world where they develop it extract the resources, pay some money to, to the government for the benefit of doing that. They're not required to do any value added, there's no steel industry or it's literally dug up and shipped out and, the, and then buying back cars or buying back steel from, from China and elsewhere. There is some um, government interventions to set up cooperative research centres at universities and um, yeah, so, but it's, it's far less directed than, than in Canada and that's what makes these three countries uh, interesting. So one of the first steps is to, as I identified, the top 25 listed companies, also oh, top 25 by cap market capitalisation, those which are involved in the resources sectors in these three countries. The other day we, we had a look at the top 20 in Russia and put the search into the web of science for university collaborative publications between local universities and these local resource sector companies. And we can see that the number of publications is relatively low, maxing out at around 100 and 115 per year. Norway has a long tradition, public ownership, public research sector, um, public research institutes on the campuses of universities to serve the oil industry. It's quite, quite obvious that, that that's contributing. But it's perhaps less obvious that you've got the smallest of those four com countries producing the, the most output. Australia, uh, in terms of aggregate output, is not doing bad compared to Canada. And then we added in the Russian data and we saw there's pretty much nothing going on until uh, a, a dramatic shift in 2015, 2016, whereby all of a sudden, there, these, and having a look at those hundred or so publications, they were not skewed by a conference a single conference where 15 papers <laughs> were, were listed as collaborative. They did look like genuine scholarly journal articles that were collaborative between the firms and, um, and, and universities here. From this data we can identify who are the most prolific co-publishers. We can also look at co-funded publications as well and uh, in each country and I've just put in red there's a, a Russian name and maybe it's 
I can't remember if it was one of the elitist names, but Kaminsky is, <laughs> um, is I had a look at his background, clearly tr trained all this at Moscow State University, really eminent professor, comes to Australia and is now one of our leading uh, collaborators on, with, with our resource sector uh, companies. The next steps are to survey and approach these people. We, we can quite easily find out who they are. Some of them are on the industry side, some of them are on the university side, and, and investigate this question of, of why they were motivated to do it, what, and what the impact they perceived their co-publications were on, um, on their firm or on the university or the advancement of knowledge or the benefit of society. Given that um, I'm running out of time, I will, are you going to raise when it's, how many minutes? Two minutes, okay. There is another project, I won't go into it, but we're looking at industry engagement of our PhDs and this has been, uh, we're broadly defining it across all external organisations, how do our PhDs engage more? Fact is, the Australian PhDs, there's a theoretical framework again, my Norwegian colleagues have developed this about why, you know, why it's important. Main thing is to see that our, well, let's, hold on, well, I'll go to the summary. We have good preconditions for industry engagement with our PhDs. Very few pursue research though that's supervised or involves internships or is any way supported financially or otherwise by, by industry. So the government is wanting to change this and incentivise it, provide internships, ensure that our PhDs who have, many of them though, have, there are some very important positives, have, have an applied, even a commercial orientation, they believe, with their research, but it's, there's just no connection, no formal connection between them and the, the industries. They're doing research on the industries where they previously worked, but not in collaboration. So the government wants to improve this through funding internships and otherwise. I say, well, one first step is to go back and look at the people who, the prolific publishers, and approach them and say, look, we recognise you as being among the most prolific publishers in collaboration in these relevant disciplines. If we can identify these people, we can better target our internships rather than having a complete scattergun approach, which is the Australian government's current approach. Okay, well, thank you. I think that'll leave it. Peter, thank you for your presentation. As far as I understand, you mainly measure the collaboration by publication approach. And do you take into the consideration something like intellectual property, Patents uh, or patents, patents, yeah, uh, uh, or uh, for instance, some business incubators uh, in universities. It also can be a kind of collaboration between business and uh, uh, universities, not only in terms of publications, but in terms of patents and uh, businesses uh, located in the university area. Well, the honest answer is I don't know yet. Um, what I have done, uh, I've looked at what I know best, which is collaborative co-publications. And they're, they're, we have got a national survey of research commercialization, which provides us with information about licensing, patenting, and, and other forms of commercialization. Um, and some of that is consistent with data reported in Canada and Norway, but I'm still at this first step of thinking, well, let's look at this area which hasn't been well examined, which is the, the motivations and the role of industry in collaborating on what Perkman described as academic exchange rather than commercialization activities. Peter, thank you for the presentation. I, I, I don't have a question, but I have like invitation. Uh, sorry, guys. <laughs> because I'm from Tumen, uh, and Tumen is one of the leading regions in Russia for oil and gas production. And my university, it's really s not not large university, but we are among the leading in Russia. And if you look at our positions, you can look that we have uh, by, if you measure collaboration with industry by money that we get from 
industries. We are um, like around five million or six million dollars just. It's average for uh, for universities that are studied by some rankings. But all of that money goes from industries. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe for you it will be like interesting case how we can collaborate and our main partners are Neftimash, Gazprom Neft, so uh, extractive industries, uh, I mean. And I have a question. How, uh, looking at our R&D in Russia, uh, all only 30% goes from uh, industrial sector and 70 or even more goes from, sta from state, from government. Mm -hmm. How our universities can compete for industrial, I mean, money that goes from industries. What should our universities do? What do you think? In such a strange, I mean, structure of expenses on R&D, not typical yeah. to Western countries. I, I Honestly, I think that's outside <laughs> my scope of expertise right now. I'm, and I'm not entirely sure when you're saying 30%, the 70-30 split, are you talking about business expenditure and R&D compared to government expenditure yeah. and yeah. yeah well I know that that does sound quite different to mm -hmm. the, com the countries that we're talking about in Australia business expenditure is much greater um, the question is whether in our case whether that business expenditure and R&D is actually real R&D or is it just coded as R&D in order to meet tax advantages and, and so forth but Sorry, I, I probably I don't really have an in, an informed answer <laughs> for you, but thanks for your invitation because I am interested in knowing more about collaboration between Russian universities and resource sector firms. Peter, um, if I may make a comment that's related to what we've said to other students, perhaps the problem here is selection bias. By assuming that your comparisons are other resource based economies, you're not asking the more important question, that the fact that Australia, with its heavy resources, is not successful in diversifying into other industries, which are not resource-based despite having putative top universities, is where you should look at it. And in particular, you need to ask, I mean, if you think about what are spontaneous collaborations, so if you think about, say, Silicon Valley. Nobody planned Silicon Valley to be Northern California. And Apple, for example, did not benefit from a formal collaboration from Stanford. They, they literally got their ideas from Xerox Park, which was giving them away. If you know the history of Apple, Steve Jobs went to Xerox Park, and in the late 60s, Xerox Park was demonstrating the technology for word processing, the mouse, what you see is what you get object-oriented programming, and a couple of other things, and Steve Jobs wanted them the Macintosh, and he asked them, how much do you want for this technology? They said nothing. So it was like a byproduct of the free information. So an interesting question might become, one, are there areas in which Australian universities have academic leadership, but no local companies are taking advantage of that? If that is true, why? Conversely, are there areas in which Australia is leading, such as resource extraction or something like that, but the best resourcer, researchers in this area are coming from the States or someplace else? Why don't they relocate to Australia? What is it that doesn't make Australia a magnet for the top scholars in this area? So it seems to me that's what you really want to look at, the, mi the mismatch, rather than just sort of say, okay, giving existing university industry collaborations, which are often artificially generated by government policy, you might want to ask why the natural links, right? Because if Australia is such a great place for resource extraction, with better institutions, say, than Russia or Brazil, and with already top universities that already speak in English, why is it natural for, say, the number one department that handles all this research to be located in Australia, or vice versa? Yeah, well, I guess one point to make is that at the moment we're not sure whether we are, or at least I'm not sure, whether we are world leaders in particular areas that are relevant to our resource industries. Mm -hmm. 
and which would mean that we're not world leaders in terms of aggregate um, collaboration um, on, the, on the metrics I've shown, but within the areas that are relevant, we, we're performing quite well. And that will come through uh, consultation with the people who are engaged in this space on the academic side and on the industry side. The, but one challenge or one, I guess, pre-existing pre idea is that the reason why, say, Norway is performing, seems to be performing a lot more R&D relevant to its oil sector relative to Australia and its um, gas and iron ore sectors is this, this long history of industry intervention from the Norwegian government that has set the framework for this to happen. So it, it, it's not, we're not talking about organically driven R&D sectors coming from the world leaders in, in Norway. We're talking about a, a long history of, 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 of industry policy that supports that. Right, but what I'm arguing is Norway is the wrong comparison. That's my point. Be by by, by start, because it's an equilibrium phenomenon yeah. already that those four countries yeah. are resource-based economies. What you really want is not to be a good resource-based economy, but a good economy, period. If that turns out in equilibrium to be a resource-based economy, then it makes sense. But by starting from the assumption that you are like Norway, but you should be a more efficient version of Norway, you are biasing your answer. That's all I'm okay. saying. OK, the very last question from Kun, very briefly. I have a more general question. Um, um, so you're looking into these collaborations, and your metric is joint publications. But a lot of the collaboration I see is much more indirect through financing. Yep. So I imagine Norway has, I'm just now talking out of my head here, I have no idea, but the Statoil Research Fund of mm -hmm. something yep. where academics can apply to. Yep. Uh, um, and in the US you have the whatever, GP Morgan Professorship of Finance uh, yep. and there. So, so industry promotes research in sectors they are interested in, uh, in many other ways than through collaborative publications, and probably more important ways in terms of money flows. Yep. And I wonder whether that would be interesting to look into. So in the, in in uh, Australia, it would be like: Is there any what uh, firm-based fund for research or firm-based yes. fund things? Can so, so, and that would be interesting to map. I think and more maybe and more than the publications. I should say that I did have a chart. I hadn't done it for Russia, and I didn't show it there. But we've, there's roughly maybe three times as many publications that are co-funded by industry that can come out of the bibliometric analysis. And then there's all of the informal exchange and other things that are not leading to, to co-publications. And the process is to first measure the co-publications and the co-funded publications, and then use this as a starting point to target surveys and interviews with these people to understand what are the intangible collaborations which really can't be measured, what are the things which we're not getting when, when we are simply looking at the traditional metrics that are, that are more easy to put on a chart showing where Australia fits compared to other countries. Okay, it's time to have a no coffee break. Thank you, Peter, for your lectures.